Foundation President uh, Jim DeMint, Senator DeMint, uh, who's at that position now, and uh, just sort of hang in here. We'll get it off and going, and then we'll have the next uh, uh, session from uh, the Heritage Foundation, Mr. Jack Spencer. Play DVD. <laughs> Hello. This is Jim DeMint of the Heritage Foundation. I wish I could be with you in person today for the Yucca Educational Symposium. The topic you're discussing, Yucca Mountain and nuclear energy, is one of the most important energy issues faced by our nation. I come from South Carolina where we get about half of our energy from nuclear power plants. In fact, South Carolina is home to the Summer Nuclear Generating Station where two of America's four new reactors are being built. We also have the Savannah River site, where many nuclear programs related to national security are undertaken. As a pioneer in nuclear energy's past, present, and future, South Carolina has more than 4,000 tons of commercial nuclear waste, and that amount continues to grow. South Carolina is storing that waste safely, but the federal government has broken promises to dispose of it, and that presents major problems, not only for South Carolina, but for states across this country. Federal law requires that taxpayers and electricity users pay Washington to take the waste. And Washington is sitting on nearly $40 billion right now that was paid for that purpose. Indeed, folks in the nuclear industry built their businesses on the promise and expectation that the government would carry out this legal responsibility. So how much nuclear waste has Washington collected for disposal? None. Absolutely zero. Astonishing, isn't it? After years of broken promises, some are starting to think that America may never solve our nuclear waste challenges. Nevada has become a scapegoat for procrastination in Washington, D.C. Thanks to poor leadership in the U.S. Senate and a compliant media, folks just assume that Nevada won't ever support Yucca Mountain, and progress on the project will always succumb to political pressure. It probably won't surprise you to hear that I think this Washington knows best approach is seriously flawed. The government will keep issuing strategic plans for nuclear waste, all while doing nothing to follow through on the one plan on which Congress and the President agreed, Yucca Mountain. We can meet so many of our nation's challenges by empowering states and the private sector. Solving the challenge of nuclear waste is no different. Thank you again for allowing me to join you from a distance as you work on these issues. I look forward to hearing about the results. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Jack Spencer. Uh, I began talking to him a couple of years ago. Uh, he is currently the director of the uh, Thomas C. Rowe Institute at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, he's still involved quite a bit. Uh, a year or so ago, he had written several uh, papers uh, concerning uh, energy throughout the country and, and nuclear energy which also included uh, a pretty detailed dissertation on uh, the uh, Yucca Mountain and the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. This is what he's going to address this morning. He also did a second paper on that, updating it in, uh, was it 2008 or uh, something along that line, 2008 or 9, which is relatively current. Um, Unfortunately, because the entire process has gone through so many years of uh, dialogue and dissertation, uh, it had to be updated. And that's what he did. That is his topic. Uh, he's going to talk about that. And we, I think, need to understand that uh, although the process is slow, uh, the, uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed in, I think it was back in 1982. 
I'd like to make a couple of comments about this process. And, and Mark referenced the uh, uh, Congress's decision on that about the, the Screw Nevada bill. I think it's only fair to understand that the state of Nevada is a very large land mass, and a lot of it is owned by the federal government for reasons of security and other things, uh, developing the atomic bomb that we used in the world wars uh, way back then. So it's in a very important strategic land mass for the United States of America, not just for the state of Nevada. And it, I think it's only fair that we understand that. And I think that a lot of people today don't understand that and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get that message over in time to uh, groups of people that we talk to uh, about that issue. And without any further discussion on my part, I would like to introduce uh, Jack Spencer from the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, before I get started, I wanted to, to draw your attention to one of the things out. Oops on the desk out there, it's this DVD. Before there was Pandora's box, there was Powering America, which is a, uh, a short 35 minute documentary that the Heritage Foundation produced about a year and a half ago on nuclear energy. And uh, what we do in this movie is uh, we visit a number of sites around the world, including um, the reprocessing facility in France, um, a mining facility in Canada, and a number of nuclear facilities, um, uh, uh, plants here in the United States. And we show folks from the inside out what nuclear energy is all about. We tell the story from the perspective of the people who work in the facilities, um, the people that live around the facilities. We don't leave it up to, um, you know, to people like me and to lobbyists and, and Washington types to tell the story of nuclear energy. We really go to the source of folks. So uh, get yourself a copy of this, and I think that it's a good educational tool in addition to hopefully you'll uh, you'll find that interesting so uh, I really appreciate being here today this is a, an important issue um, before I get started though I do want to thank Gary Dort and the US Nuclear Energy Foundation for putting this great conference together and for inviting me here to speak the topic I was asked to discuss was the Nuclear Waste Policy Act now, I might be the only person in the world who thinks this, but there's really no issue I would rather be talking about this morning. Well, maybe deer hunting or Baltimore Ravens football, but, but other than those two things, uh, this is the issue that I think is really critical, and here's why. The nation's energy future is as critical as an issue we face today, and it's among the most misunderstood. It's only getting more so as time progresses. Too many folks, especially politicians, think that ener energy solutions come from Washington. Um, and I need to say that after hearing two good congressmen like uh, we heard this morning, it makes me question my own uh, libertarian philosophy because what you're going to hear throughout the rest of the talk is how much I don't trust guys like that and how they shouldn't be decision makers. So those fellows notwithstanding, uh, I'll go forward. They think that bureaucrats and the elected officials can somehow micromanage the energy economy. They think that by subsidizing certain energy sources and inflating the costs of others, that they can do that. But we need to learn that economic outcomes cannot be centrally, contr centrally controlled by some self-empowered elite. It has never worked and it never will. Perhaps nowhere is this misunderstanding more obvious and more consequential than with nuclear, nuclear power. You see, I believe that nuclear energy has the potential to change the world for the better. It is clean, it's safe, demonstrably affordable, and most of all, it's extremely flexible. Not only can nuclear power bring power to our biggest cities, but also the smallest vi villages in every corner of the earth. But here's the thing. Nuclear energy is being held back. And it's not being held back for safety reasons and not for technology reasons. I would even argue that it's not being held back for economic reasons. Nuclear energy is being held back simply for policy and politics reasons. And much of that strife, I would argue, actually emanates from the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed into law in 1982 and was subsequently amended a number of times. 
At that time, America's commercial nuclear industry was coming of age. What began in 1954, when the Atomic Energy Commission first began licensing commercial nuclear reactors, had turned into 70 operating reactors with about 15,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel at that point in 1982. And a lot occurred between 1954 and 82, and I'd like to take a moment to discuss those years. This is important, not merely because it's interesting, but because it's very relevant to where we find ourselves today. Though the government began licensing reactors in 1954, it made a decision to maintain title to any special nuclear materials used in the reactors or produced at those facilities. This set in motion the mentality that government should be responsible for waste disposal. This, I believe, is the root of our problem. Though Washington decided to maintain, a, maintain title of the waste, it did look to the private sector to provide commercial waste management services. Indeed, by 1957, the Atomic Energy Commission had said that it wouldn't provide any of these services in the future. The private sector responded. Talks began almost immediately between private companies and the AEC. Then in 1966, the AEC actually issued an operating permit for the West Valley Commercial Reprocessing Facility near Buffalo, New York. Though it never processed any commercial waste, it did process 640 tons of national security waste before it shut down in 1976. And this wasn't the only reprocessing facility licensed. A GE plant was licensed in 1967, and another one began construction in South Carolina in 1970. Do you know that even Exxon applied for a license to build a reprocessing facility? Now, ultimately, none of these facilities ever reprocess commercial nuclear fuel. However, upon ceasing construction in 1972, the, the GE facility actually was licensed as an interim storage facility. I mention these instances because they demonstrate the willingness by the private sector to invest in nuclear waste management services and the willingness of communities to accept these types of industrial activities. Admittedly, while there weren't any sustainable solutions during this time, there was action. There was investment and experimentation. Industry was innovating and moving toward a solution. While it hadn't come to one yet, industry was clearly working on it. But then came President Ford's announcement that reprocessing should not move forward. That was followed by President Carter's pronouncement that the U.S. would ju just no longer engage in commercial reprocessing activities. This changed the situation significantly. Now we were severely limited to how to manage waste. Now our choice was, well, there was no choice. It was geologic storage or geologic disposal. And at the same time, the nuclear industry was struggling. Prices were beginning to skyrocket. Energy demand had fallen significantly. The anti-nuclear movement was gaining momentum because of concerns of proliferation and safety. And the regulatory burden was significantly on the rise. Then Three Mile Island happened. And unfortunately, most of these headwinds emerged before a whole slew of new nuclear plants had been ordered. So here the industry stood in the 1970s and early 80s, oversubscribed, expensive, disliked by the public, and feeling pressure from Washington. And with 70 reactors up and running, and a bunch more under construction and even more ordered, future waste requirements became a very serious problem that needed to be resolved. This led to lawsuits challenging the issuance of any new reactor license until a waste disposal path was established. Indeed, the NRC said that it wouldn't license any reactors until this disposal pathway was determined. This became known as the waste confidence issue. Something simply had to be done at that point. So Congress and industry came up with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Essentially, the act established America's policy on nuclear waste management and disposal. It officially placed the responsibility for waste disposal with the federal government and created a process by which to carry out that responsibility. It also created a financing mechanism to pay for the disposal. This seemed to fix all the problems, right? It created a pathway to provide confidence that there would be, di there would be disposal so you could start issuing license again. It would keep the nuclear materials in the safe hands of government, allegedly. It would start moving the used fuel off reactor sites. This was very important to the utilities at the time who spent fuel pools 
were filling up and they were incurring costs that they didn't anticipate. And it forced nuclear waste producers to pay for waste management as it produced the waste. So here it seemed to fix all the problems, yet it has failed horribly. So what happened? I'm just going to go over a few key dates over that time period. The first real problem occurred in 1985 when some government rules changed. So this money that was paid into the nuclear waste fund that would go to pay for nuclear waste became much more difficult to access. It became subject to congressional appropriations and that whole piece of the, the puzzle make, uh, introduced a whole lot of politics into it. It's made getting that money appropriated um, very difficult, and there were appropriations over the years, but now we're finding that, there, that that's, uh, it's almost impossible to get money for disposal activities. Now, how did Yucca get involved? In 1987, Congress dire directed DOE to focus solely on Yucca, and as was discussed earlier, um, you pr probably all know the story better than I of, the, uh, of how that happened. I'm just going through and saying what did happen. Um, Another big date was 1998 when DOE failed it to accept, start accepting nuclear waste. That was according to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act when the federal government was supposed to start accepting waste. Um, when they didn't, the utilities began suing the federal government. So not only do ratepayers through the nuclear waste fee pay for Yucca Mountain, but now by pay because the <coughs> government's liable for not picking up this waste, the taxpayers are also on the hook for paying for that liability. In 2002, DOE determined that Yucca is suitable. Congress and the President accepted that determination, and they amended the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to designate Yucca as the only site to be characterized. In 1990, I'm sorry, in 2008, the NRC formally dockets the DOE Yucca application, triggering a three-year review schedule. Now, in 2009-2010, the Obama administration comes in, and without giving any scientific or technical reason, they declared Yucca as not a workable option, and they moved to withdraw the application from the NRC. The NRC concluded that given the administration's policy that it has the authority to stop all review activities despite having $11 million in appropriated activities. Now, we heard earlier uh, that, that the NRC is an independent commission, and it should be, and I wish that it were, but it's not. Um, the commission is political, um, and we've seen that played out, not just with this administration, but with other ones in the past. Now, what is not political, and this is really key, is the technical staff of the NRC. We heard a, a bit about the uh, SCR, the, the Safety Evaluation Report, and what that determines. That's the determination of the technical staff of the NRC, and I would argue that that is not a political document. Now, what will happen now is the SCR will be given to the NRC Commission um, the five commissioners who will make their determination of the staff's work, and we'll see how that, that plays out. So once the NRC stops this process, this is where the story, I think, gets really interesting. Um, you see, the President acted as if the Nuclear Waste Policy Act didn't exist. He attempted to terminate the program in direct con contradiction of the law. And the ironic thing here is, the president had called me up, not that he would, but if he did, I would have explained this to him. I could have told him how to kill Yucca Mountain. What he did essentially um, did just the opposite because doing this instigated a series of lawsuits, all of which reaffir reaffirmed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act as the law of the land. Most recently, the court reminded the administration that even it had to follow the law, and it concluded that the NRC must work on the, on the application review so long as there are funds appropriated for it, and as I mentioned, there are $11 million there now. Another of the lawsuits was over the nuclear waste fee. The utilities representatives argued that since the administration had no nuclear waste plan, it had no right to collect the $750 million a year, uh, a year in fees. And the third was on waste confidence. After all, if Yucca program provided the basis for waste confidence, then how could there be any confidence in a future repository if there was no program. So here we are today. The nation's nuclear waste policy is in utter chaos, just like 1982. The NRC is not issuing any license, just like 1982. An industry that was excited to start building a whole bunch of new reactors is now in decline, just like maybe a little bit before 1982, but the same time period. Um, and if this weren't enough, 
reaction. Spent fuel continues to build up on each site. And by the way, the uh, utilities are still, still maintaining control of the nuclear waste safely, I might add. Despite all of this, I remain optimistic. I believe that a long-term workable solution can emerge out of this chaos if we simply recognize the underlying flaws of the current system. For example, we need to remove the ultimate responsibility for waste management from the federal government. It just doesn't work. We saw during the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s that the private sector will come up with waste management options. We see the U.S. Nuclear Energy Foundation with their ideas on public-private partnerships trying to do the exact same thing today. We just need a system that incentivizes it, that allows it. And putting waste producers in charge of their own waste management is just the way to do it. And there's proof that this works. If you look around the world, France, Finland, Sweden, any place, the key, the common thread to every nuclear waste management program that works is waste manager or waste producers are in charge of their own waste management. Any place where you see a dysfunctioning nuclear waste system, it's the exact, it, you have this disconnect between waste production and ultimate re responsibility. Even in this country, we often hear about the WIP facility. Who owns the WIP facility? Federal government. What kind of waste goes into the WIP facility? Federal waste. That's the key. We need to get the government out of financing nuclear waste. Once producers are responsible for management, then they should just pay providers directly for waste services. We need to remove Washington from any negotiations related to nuclear waste. You just can't trust them, and frankly, they should have no business being involved in these kinds of business decisions anyway. I wonder if Yucca would have turned out differently if Gary and the U.S. Nuclear Energy Foundation had been emp empowered to negotiate directly with utilities a deal to bring nuclear waste management services to Nevada rather than the Department of Energy coming here to tell Nevada how things were going to go under the pretense of a negotiation. I say let's finish the Yucca application review. Assuming the, M N the NRC deems it safe, let's issue the permit. Then we transfer that permit to Nevada, a Nevada-based interest like Gary's group, for example, and allow them to negotiate with industry. E empowering people, that's how we fix this problem. Thank you and look forward to any questions. No questions. I can talk more. Um, I enjoyed your presentation, and I've known a lot about the Heritage Foundation for some time, um, and I totally agree with your last assessment. My question is, um, is, is since there's such a big groundswell, 80% 80, 80 of the House of Representatives is for this, uh, it would seem like there would be a movement whether it's yucca or whatever to get this, to, but I think the private way to doing it is the only way to go. I totally agree with that. And I think it takes an organization like Heritage and, and USNEF and others just putting a lot of pressure on yeah. it, and that's the only way to go, and, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. So keep up the good work. Well, well thank you. Um, yeah, you know, as, as the congressman said earlier, there is broad political support for Yucca Mountain. And I agree with him that they're prob it's probably going to happen one way or the other. Um, to me, that's not the optimal outcome, though. And we didn't get into this. But to me, having the private interests, uh, the private producers responsible for their own waste management has implications far beyond coming up with a solution for nuclear waste. You see, until the private waste producers are responsible for their own waste, they don't care what that waste stream looks like because the government's going to come pick it up or they're supposed to come pick it up and when they don't they sue. Once you connect that, once you connect the, the waste back end to the power production front end, now you start getting private interests, the private sector interested in the kind of um, reactor technology that's there, the waste streams. So when people ask about thorium or these different technologies, that's the way to get that stuff to, to, to push forward. Um, now it's all about who has the best lobbyists and you know you're using politics uh, to drive business decision-making, and that's never sustainable. 
my comment, you know, you present a lot of good things, but logic and politics don't really meet too well together. It, I have written to uh, Governor Sandoval and Dean Heller, both of whom are, you know, give me the pablum that the government hasn't said that it's safe. Okay, well, of course, that's a that's always going to be the case. But it appears to me that until we get the Sandoval's and the Hellers on our side, it's just another exercise in more government and frustration. Yeah, I think that that's probably correct at some level. I'm not a political an analyst, but I will say this. That's the reason why the safety evaluation report is so critical, because the government hasn't said if it's safe. Um, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that's the body charged with doing exactly that. We're going to find out if, uh, if they determine it as a safe facility. And um, if politicians want to not accept that finding, then I would suggest we have far greater problems than whether or not Yucca is safe or not, because then they essentially are questioning the regulatory foundation on which our entire nuclear industry is built. And I don't know if that's the exact direction that, that they want to go in. Is government the only one that has nuclear waste that we are uh, worried about or have well, at all? Are there any private? Uh, government doesn't have any. Well, that's not true. Uh, the vast majority of nuclear waste is produced by and held by private interests. Um, it's simply the government's responsibility to take it because of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, but they haven't done that yet. But we um, have nuclear subs and. Yeah, nuclear so, I was, th so there is. Um, I think it's about 7,000 tons of, mm. of defense waste that's from mm. the subs, um, aircraft carriers, and the nuclear weapons program. Most of that is held in Idaho, South Carolina, and Washington. And that's why those are the three states that led some of the lawsuits um, against the federal government, because that is waste that um, essentially the federal government promised them as well that they would come get it if they were able to produce it in those states. But Washington just has it on the docks, right, from their nuclear ships. They I don't know the about answer. about it being in barrels on docks. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I don't know. I'm not able to answer that. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's all fairly secure. Now, Washington does have a lot of, uh, they're called tanks, these uh, mm -hmm. tanks of, of liquid waste from the nuclear weapons program. And this, by the way, is very instructive, I think, on why, how, the, how different the private sector handles these things than, than the government. When the government was building nuclear weapons and they needed plutonium, their, motive, or their objective was to produce as much plutonium as possible. And instead of, a, a, instead of separating the waste streams in a way that would make it easier for disposal at a later date, they just threw it all into these tanks. And now it's, it's, it's not impossible, but it's extraordinarily difficult to clean that stuff up. What you see time and again is all of the all of the examples we have of a nuclear facility being dangerous, um, dirty, or anything of the like. Those are all government facilities. Private nuclear facilities are amongst the cleanest, safest industrial facilities you will ever set foot in. Could you give me an example of who is a private facility nuclear? Sure. Um, any of the utilities. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So Congressman Shimkus mentioned Exelon, which is the largest one, but there are lots of them. But then there are companies like Babcock and Wilcox that do a lot of work in nuclear. Um, Areva, world leader um, in, in nuclear. So lots of companies do all that kind of work. In fact, the private sector, the private sector does virtually all nuclear operations, government and commercial. Um, so this idea that the government somehow has a moral responsibility or somehow better able to take care of nuclear waste is simply flawed. Some people think that uh, Nye County is a, a nuclear-free zone. Uh, what is the difference between over 900 nuclear bombs detonated in my county versus spent fuel? We know what's in the spent fuel. We don't know. All of us don't know what's in the bomb that's been de detonated. 
Yeah, I, I mean, Gary, I think you, you and everyone else here probably knows the answer to that question. I mean, spent nuclear fuel is, uh, it's, a, it's an industrial byproduct that is safely handled. Um, look, I'm not going to criticize the, the weapons program either, because as far as I'm concerned, that kept us from speaking Russian. So um, I'm good with that as well, and I thank Nevada every day for uh, taking on that burden. But it's a far different one than the, than the commercial nuclear fuel use. Back to the policy issues for a moment. Does the Heritage Foundation see any need to change the current policy, make legislative changes to allow the private person, uh, public yeah. entities to exist? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there, there are a couple of different ways you can go about doing this. You can, you could amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to allow for it. Um, or you could scrap the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and start all over again. Uh, the former is probably the more reasonable approach, but really what we need is a general recognition that the government's not the right entity to be responsible for nuclear waste management. Once we come to that conclusion, then we can make the, um, you can amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to allow for it. But see, there's a number of problems in getting there. You have, and I hate to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not characterizing Congressman Shimkus as the problem, because he is not. He is by far um, part of the solution. But he supports sort of the traditional program, the, the way the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was laid out, and he just wants that to work, I think, not speaking for him. I think we need greater reform than that. I think that it needs to be out of the hands of government. So, um, so you know, it, it depends on how you, how you want to go about it. I, I've even worked on sort of re, uh, changing the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations a little bit so you can add in some elements of the market. What you, you, I would like to see a full privatization piece uh, approach, but you can introduce elements of the market uh, under a more restricted approach by simply doing this. By making the utilities responsible and getting rid of the nuclear waste fund so that utilities are paying a specific price for a specific service for, um, for waste management services. You can still have the government, you can still have a government entity who's supposed to provide nuclear waste management services, but they would con the, the utilities would pay that entity to do it. Um, that gives the utilities, one of the things, one of the reasons they really resist any kind of reform is that they have the, um, they like the security of knowing I'm gonna produce the waste and the government's gonna be responsible for it. There's no question about that. Um, there's a question about how the government's gonna go about doing it, but that basic equation is true. But you lose any, uh, any element of the marketplace with that. So what you could do is you could have a government entity who has to provide nuclear waste management services. So the utilities have that security of knowing that there's someone there who's going to take it. But that instead of paying a flat nuclear waste fee into a separate account that pays the government entity to do the services, you would just have the utilities pay that government entity directly. And here's the key. They don't have to go to them. So the government entity might do it. And if you think that the government can provide a, s a better service for a lower price, then they'll be successful. Of course, I would bet my bottom dollar that that wouldn't be the case. But you allow them to compete. Compete. So maybe Arriva or some other company can says, you know, I can provide you this service better and cheaper. Um, so you can introduce elements of competition and accurate pricing in the market while still maintaining that that security that the utilities want as you transition to a, a better system. I like to point out that. The overwhelming majority of politicians in this country want this problem solved. And as Mark Anthony said to Nevada, tag you're it. And it's going to happen. The, the, those who are fighting this are eventually going to be uh, blown out of the water uh, over time because the entire environmental movement is anti-God, anti-Jew, anti-capitalism and anti-technology. And these folks, you know, are gonna lose in the end because the overwhelming majority of people want this problem dealt with. Now, in New Zealand, <coughs> what they did with the railroads, which was, still is, owned by their government, or, uh, originally, the whole thing was managed by government, okay? And eventually, New Zealand wised up, and while the government still owns the railroads, okay, in New Zealand, 
they turned over the management of the uh, of the railroad over to private industry who proceeded to get rid of uh, useless uh, services to towns that made no economic sense they fired 75 percent of the government bureaucrats and they cleaned up the mess and that's what's going to ha have to happen in this country when you're dealing <coughs> with plutonium and and these other things again this this is something that, that I believe that should be handled by the federal government. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, they can still put out contracts, you know, <coughs> to build nuclear reactors, to build, you know, weapons and all the rest of the stuff. But it's going to take a private free enterprise system to manage the thing. Uh, your nuclear power plants today on your aircraft carriers last for 20 years. Unrefueled. That's how long it goes. You know, and I am familiar with nuclear weapons, and, and let me tell you, folks, they're a whole lot smaller than you think they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I agree, at least in, in as far as the private sector will be where the solutions are ultimately found. Um, history tells us that. there. Uh, I don't know of one example of uh, the federal government doing a good job in commercial nuclear space. Are there Anything other questions else? for Mr. Spencer? Mr. Spencer? Yes. We, uh, if you have a couple of more statements, I see Gary and Ken are busily tied up at the moment. Uh, more statements. I don't know if I have any more statements or not. Um, Gary? The nuclear option. Well, Congressman Shimkus mentioned it earlier, but as as he mentioned, the uh, the Senate went ahead and changed over 200 years of tradition and the uh, and principle in the Senate to get rid of the filibuster. There, um, they seem not to recognize that our founders wanted the Senate to be a more deliberative body than uh, than the House. But nonetheless, they've done that. And what this right now, it's only for judicial nominations. Um, but the fact is this, we've crossed the threshold there, and it seems like uh, it's not a huge step to subject all Senate business to, 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 to this new way of doing things. So what that means for Yucca is, uh, as Senator Heller pointed out, it's a vote for Yucca, potentially. So we'll see. Um, look, Yucca is already the law of the land, so what we're really talking about here is money for yucca. The courts have spoken. If there's appropriated funds for yucca, then it's going forward. So certainly um, it makes things like that easier. But nonetheless, um, you still have uh, Senator Reid as the Senate Majority Leader, and he has a lot of control over what that body does. And so long as he is there, um, look, yucca is going to be difficult. It just is. And uh, I do agree, I think, again, I'm not a political guy, so I, I'm really not qualified to speak on that, but if you look at um, where the president is from in Illinois, the amount of nuclear waste they have there, um, you know, if something did get through the Senate, maybe he wouldn't veto it, I don't know. Um, he's not running for election again, so I don't know if that would have anything to do with it or not. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a sad premise I think it's one that people will regret at some point, but I don't know. Uh, but it does make yucca a whole lot, a, a, a bit easier. Yes. Hi, I was wondering if you could tell me how the progress is going on the reprocessing uh, of the nuclear waste, and yeah. and what percentage uh, of the waste could be recycled. Um. Well, there is no progress in this country. We don't do reprocessing here. Um, France reprocesses. South Korea wants to reprocess. There are a handful of countries that do. Um, so here, there is no progress on it. And the amount that can be reprocessed, it depends on the type of reprocessing you use. But something like 96% using um, 
using the, the process that is most commercially available now. It's about 96% that can be reprocessed because most of what your nuclear fuel is um, remains largely unchanged. So um, you can get some plutonium out of there, you get your uranium out of there, and you can fabricate that into new fuel. Um, the real advantage to reprocessing, I believe, <coughs> is not one that, um, it's not the fuel value per se, but it's your, it gives you flexibility on waste management. So people are often quick to look at reprocessing and say, all right, we shouldn't do reprocessing because it costs this much versus Yucca Mountain, which costs that much. The fact is, we don't have Yucca Mountain or reprocessing. That's why it's so important for the business, for the waste producers to be in charge of it, because then they can look at all these different attributes and variables and det determine what makes most business sense. Because it very well might be the case, if we did, a, if we did the, if we did, it, if we did Yucca how I think we should do it, where you have a Nevada-based interest, and they're negotiating, negotiating with industry a price, a, not essentially, a specifically a price that makes it worthwhile for everyone. Presumably that price is going to be kind of hefty, which is fine. That's what negotiations are all about. Um, now the waste producer knows what it costs to put stuff in Yucca Mountain. So Arriva might come along and say, you know what? Given how much it costs for you to put that high-level waste in Yucca, I can provide you a reprocessing service. I can give you a little bit of value out of some fuel, and I can give you this much reduction in high-level nuclear waste that it will cost you this much less to put into Yucca Mountain. Those, that's the way we need to think of this in a more holistic business sense. When you get government involved, it's, no one looks at it that way. It's a ridiculous way. It, it, it's no wonder we can't get things done. So another thing would happen. Once, once, um, once Yuck is up and running and, they, and the world can see, all right, they're operating safely, they have business going on, um, they're making money out there, then maybe some other state says, you know what, I think I want to get in that business. I want to compete with that. Now we have price competition. Um, that's, the way this would, this, that's the way this works out. Um, but we don't do it under the, current, under the current system. It's probably more than what you wanted for just what's going on with reprocessing, but I can't help it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and your questions. And thank you once again, Gary. I really appreciate it. We'll take a five or six minute break here, and then we'll uh, start the next session. And I really kind of hope that, uh, that you will hang around for as many sessions as you can get, because uh, uh, the next one coming up, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Robert Edmonds from Arriva, and he uh, is talking about uh, the Boston Consulting Group. They hired the Boston Consulting Group a couple years ago to uh, put together a, an economic analysis of uh, Yucca Mountain as a storage-only facility and uh, Plan B as eventually as both storage and uh, reprocessing environment. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. I, I can mention a couple of years ago I talked to Dr. Sophonidis, uh, who is ill today. Uh, he ran some numbers on the 60,000 metric tons that we currently have that needs to go. It's probably 65. Uh, I, I lose track of the years. Uh, but uh, he's calculated that uh, there reprocessed uh, spent fuel on the average has a competitive cost ratio to newly enriched uh, uranium ore. At least that's what I, I understand. And uh, he uh, calculated that uh, it has a, a, a estimated value of about $12 billion. And the problem is for the Congress, is that in order to, for us to build that first reprocessing facility, uh, it's a $30 billion price tag. So how do you amortize it? You have to look at anything nuclear over, over 60 or 80 years. Uh, and that's the problem that we have with the business economics about things. Anyway, that's uh, just a side note. Uh, give me a couple of minutes and we'll start a, the next one session, please.